This podcast is sponsored by Picmonic. In 2011, two medical students came up with the ingenious idea to combine medical education with unforgettable characters and ridiculously memorable stories. Featuring over 35,000 high-yield facts and graphics, Picmonic has helped over 600,000 students improve exam scores and perform better clinically. Picmonic has resources for pre-med and medical students, as well as other healthcare professions. Check out the show notes for a link to their website. Mention the podcast when you subscribe. With Picmonic, you can study less, but remember more. The Black Doctors Podcast highlights the stories of minority professionals with the goal of inspiring others. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and share with others, because the next generation can't be what they don't see. Tune in every Monday to hear our stories told by us. All right. Welcome back to the Black Doctors Podcast. I'm Stephen, your host. I'm joined by a friend of the show. He was, I think, on one of our initial seasons, Dr. Wilton Triggs. Welcome back. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. As you may remember, you probably don't remember because we got a lot of new listeners since then. Dr. Triggs is a plastic surgeon. He is a graduate of Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee. And last time we kind of focused on his uh, journey into medical school and through medical school and, and getting out the mud. He has an incredible story. Um, if you go back and listen to the episode and the things that he overcame, um, we just want to touch base. A lot has happened. There's a, a lot's happened over the last couple of years. Oh yeah, for sure. Since last time we uh, we spoke, uh, I was in a whole new school. I was in a whole nother village. I'm in a city now. <laughs> so it's a whole different perspective at this point, especially from a plastic a plastic surgery standpoint. Yeah, for sure. Well, I want to ask, uh, we'll kind of focus on the first question because a lot of folks are at smaller programs, whether they're DO schools, Caribbean medical schools, smaller MD programs that they may not have or be affiliated with a plastic surgery residency program. I know at Howard, um, we didn't have a residency program. We had plastic surgeons. We didn't have a neurosurgery program. We had like one neurosurgeon. And that significantly, that can have a, a huge uh, impact on your ability to match into a challenging specialty. So at Meharry Medical College, what exposure did you have to plastic surgery and how did you navigate to successfully match? So for me, I never even considered plastic surgery. I was gung-ho neurosurgery. I shadowed some neurosurgeons, didn't like it. Um, and so I had an interest in dermatology because my maternal grandmother died in melanoma. And so, you know, it's rare. And so that kind of piqued my interest. So I did a one month kind of like fellowship or it was an internship at Vanderbilt for dermatology. So, I, you know, I was on basically on a dermatology rotation as a second year medical student. And when it came to the most surgery component where you're doing most a lot of skin biopsies and uh, skin cancer resection, I really liked it. Uh, working with our hands and, you know, seeing the patients and stuff like that. And they're like, well, you should check out plastics just to make a, a better decision than what you like. And so I did my two week rotation during my surgery rotation at Meharry, which was at Vanderbilt okay. and loved it and loved it. So and that's what got, got me hooked. Awesome. So you had a kind of a system built in where Meharry students could rotate with the Vanderbilt mm -hmm. University and, and get yep. that awesome. Yep. Did you do any away rotations? I did. I I uh initially scheduled three, but I only wound up doing two because I had some financial issues. The, my Malibu, my 2000 Malibu was, it died <laughs> in the middle of Kentucky <laughs> <laughs> when I was on rotation at the University of Kentucky. And they have like a really strong hand and uh, reconstructive program at Kentucky. And then I did a, a formal, a more formal rotation as a fourth year at Vanderbilt. And uh, I was going to go to Loma Linda, but, you know, that was all the way in Cali. And so when I had those card troubles, I had to cancel that. But, uh, yeah, those formal rotations, I learned more then than I ever did when I just did that two-week rotation because there was stuff in plastic surgery. I didn't even know they did as plastic surgery because hmm. I was just blown away. Yeah. Tell us about this Malibu, man. Uh, yeah, man, the Midnight Blue Malibu with the 47 <laughs> tag, Huntsville, Alabama. Yeah, man, I got that car freshman year of uh, undergrad. And uh, I sent the money to my dad. My dad bought it and drove it from Houston. And I had that Malibu all through uh, undergrad and then all through med school. It was, I mean, it it had been through the ring. I drove it everywhere. Got hit by deer. I mean, it, it, took, Wait, it took a hit. You, so you hit deer. No, the deer hit me. Because, <laughs> you know, they get, they get spooked by the headlights and they come running towards the light. And so, man, I think I got hit by two deer in one year. And uh, 
Yeah, it was just time for a new car, man. It was it was rough. <laughs> oh man, yeah, I definitely got some stories about my car, my uh, '95 Fleetwood Cadillac Brougham. That was my first car. <laughs> That's how you know it's real when you can like spit it off like that. Yep, <laughs> the year and everything. That, uh, I got it my junior year of college. And senior year, I remember gas prices were going up. You know, everybody's on the news like, yo, gas prices. They had a 42-gallon gas tank. And they're like, gas prices are going up. So what, are, what, you, what do you got to do? You got to fill up the gas tank while it's still cheap. So I filled the gas tank up. And I went out the, other, the, the next day, and there was an oil slick that went from under my car down across like six different parking spots. And I looked under the, under oh, the, no. the car, and I could just see gas dripping out the tank. But I couldn't afford <laughs> All to get money. it replaced. I was broke, man. Yeah. I couldn't get it, get it yeah. replaced. So I drove that car three more years with a leaky gas tank. <laughs> Man, I can't believe you did that. I would have been scared. <laughs> it's about light a match. It's a wrap. <laughs> sure. We'd be driving around. We'd be out at night. They're like, you smell gas? I'm like, nah, nah, nah. We, we're good. Just, um, <laughs> Man, so yeah, those cars are, are something. The good Lord be getting you getting you through some stuff. I'm telling you, for sure. So you did the away rotations, which again, I, I highly advocate for. You get an incredible exposure to other stuff. For sure. But you had to go through the match process. And for a lot mm-hmm. of folks, man, that is stressful. You're applying to a reach. Uh, well, I don't know your, your grades. I was reaching um, when I was applying to anesthesia. But it's competitive. You know that going in. How did you select and make that rank list and... Were you stressed out during the match period? Were you confident and calm? How was that for you? Oh man, it was like a, it was like a little hodgepodge of everything. So for me, you know, I had uh, I had like enough interviews where I felt like I was confident on match because when I would interview the program director, they would they would just straight up ask you how many interviews do you have, and I would tell them, oh, you should match. I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. I, I was still worried, right? But I I had a mentor at Vanderbilt to look over my match list, which was the chair of Vanderbilt. And then I had like another mentor at Vanderbilt that looked over my match list. And then I talked to Aisha McKnight Barron, who's a big time mm-hmm. plastic surgeon in, um, in Atlanta. And she, she, I think she was Baylor's, she was my Harry's first plastics match in an integrated program. So she was like my mentor going through all this and she had just finished her chief year. And so I talked to her and kind of made my rank list. I actually, Man, I I had talked to so many people about this, but really, you know, when it came to deciding, it was just like gut feeling, to be honest. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I was so happy with the the results. It, it was it was incredible. But uh, it was it was a hard situation, a hard choice because I actually did I I have, I applied to every program in the country, and I went to all my interviews except for one, and I felt so bad. But it was just too expensive. It was Oklahoma. Yeah. It was like eight hundred dollars just for the ticket. And like in plastics, they're not paying to put you up in the room. They don't pay for your travel, anything. You get that free love, pre night dinner, and that was it. And so uh, a good friend of mine who who's an anesthesiologist, he he was like, Man, if you don't match, <laughs> it's not because you didn't match that program. He said some other words, you know, I kind of censored that <laughs> out, but you know what I'm saying? So after that, I was just like, Man, I'm just gonna do it. And uh, everything worked out in his favor. That highlights, you know, one of the disparities when it comes from folks from different socioeconomic status as we enter this pathway and pop into medical school. Like, we can't afford the resources to do well on standardized exams. We can't afford to apply to every program, to travel to every interview. And it's one of the parts of that leaky pipeline. I think uh, Quentin Capers is a cardiologist out of Ohio State. He has a lot of papers on it and how we don't have more diversity in medicine because of this leaky, leaky pipeline and along the way through various reasons, we get weeded out. Right, for sure, for sure. You, you said you had a, a gut feeling, though, about the program you matched at. Can you elaborate on that? Oh, yeah, for sure. So when I first interviewed at Meharry, they they preached this whole thing about uh, family and everything. Everybody's a family. I wasn't really trying to hear that. I was coming from a PWI, you know, a predominantly white institution where there's a lot of competition um, yeah. because it was a big theater school into the University of Alabama School of Medicine. And so you didn't hear that. And so I would hear and I didn't really think nothing of it until I matriculated and it was like a, like a big family. And so I kind of wanted to have that same experience when I went to residency, even though it wasn't high on my list, what I was looking for. But when I interviewed at the University of South Florida, it was like everybody was like brothers and sisters, like they were clowning on each other, like seemed like everybody knew each other, knew what they had going on. And you just felt this like sense of camaraderie. And I think what really sold me is they do these skits for the chief residents that's graduating during their um, their uh, their graduation. 
And you could see like how much details they knew about the chief resident and how they, you know, like made fun of them, how the attendings were super approachable, how they approached the attendings. And and for me, I was like, I was sold. I, I was like, man, this is it. This is it for me. So that yeah. was that kind of like gut, that kind of like gut feeling like, yeah, I fit, it, like I felt like I belong. Yeah, I, I agree completely on, on two things. One, my transition from a PWI to to Howard it was weird. You're like, Oh, we're family. I was like, mm, uh, yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we had like big brothers and big sisters and mentors and they were handing down these, uh, right, raggedy right. textbooks. And I'm like, that's eh, all right. Right. And then by the end of it, I'm like, yo, that was some of the, you know, four of the best years of my life. Um, the connections mm-hmm. that you form at these, uh, HBC medical schools, totally the, agree. Totally the agree. times that you have at these, uh, medical schools, it's, it's, uh, something, something else. And then, uh, the gut feeling, yeah, when I was interviewing for residency, like, and I can't imagine how tough it is for folks doing these virtual interviews because a lot of it's like, man, when I saw the operating rooms at the University of Chicago, like these joints were nice. And some places you go to, they're like that grungy green color mm-hmm. and everything's little faded. hole in the walls, like closets. <laughs> man, I'm like, I, I couldn't. I went to a couple of those. I'm like, I just, I just can't be in these operating rooms. But the operating rooms I went to at the University of Chicago was, was immaculate, brand new TVs yeah. everywhere. I was like, yo, I, I could see myself here. I just had that gut feeling. And, you know, people look at locations, like a big, one of the big drivers and uh, the status of the program is a big thing, but you know, you can't dis- discredit that gut feeling. I don't know how you get a gut feeling over a Zoom interview. Um, right. <laughs> but yeah. Dope. So you navigated, you were the first uh, Black male to graduate from that residency program uh, in plastic surgery. Did you have any challenges um, due to that fact? Oh, man. <sighs> I will say that, um, you know, I had a very diverse core faculty. Really? Uh, my core faculty is, you know, pretty bomb. But, you know, it was like mostly on my outside rotations or like from patients where I would feel like a little, you know, a little uneasy. You know, you get like certain comments and things like that. Uh, you know, certain general surgery rotations. I felt like, you know, I was like under the microscope. You know, I would see other residents or interns like, you know, you know, barely get away with everything. And, it, you know, right. you forget the dot of I on the order and, you know, they coming at you oh, or you yeah, see it know. in your uh, evaluation, you know, you pull out your phone at the wrong opportunity. Like he's always on his phone. And, you know, it, it, it was like, I had to like, kind of really like stay buttoned up. And right. uh, yeah. And a lot of it, I didn't even notice until like later, like late, you know, it was a six year residency that I, you know, I just kind of like start, cause I would hear things from other residents. They, they would come and talk to me and tell me, and I'm like, and so, yeah, man, I, I would definitely say uh, like residency was definitely a traumatic experience for me. Like sometimes I still have PTSD. If I hear a pager go off, oh, yeah. you know, I still kind of, my heart races, you know. Um, I remember like the long call weekends, you know, the presentations where like we would give grand rounds starting second year. And it was grueling, man. You had to know your stuff because they were going to come at you. And um, it, uh, it it was definitely uh, there was an article. And I, I think you read it too. And it was, it was like gaslighting of the, of the yeah. um, black the resident. resident. The man, resident I, in, uh, I, yeah, yeah. yeah. Me and Atala talked about it. it. I felt, I, man, I felt that in my soul. Like I could have, I could have like shed a tear reading that article. Cause that, it just yeah. brought back all these memories. And I was like, man, I thought I was healed. You know, if I was healed from this, no, man, it, I still feel it. Like I, I totally, I totally felt where that, that resident was coming from. For sure. And, and, and I, I feel like when you start down that pathway, like the first part of medical school, the part of residency is like you're just trying to make it. You're just trying to get in there, learn the system, learn the ropes and just survive. And then, like you said, a couple of years in, you start to sit back and be like, oh, wait a minute. Like they're treating right. me different than that yeah. person. Mm-hmm. Um, and it definitely like it sits in like you start thinking back about everything that happened. Yep, exactly. That's exactly right. The other thing that I wanted to talk about w- with that is the outside rotations, because we got a big push for diversity, mm-hmm. equity, and inclusion. You'll go to these like fantastic uh, academic programs, and I'll be like, yo, we're all about DEI work. Uh, but just because that program is all about it, when they send you out to their affiliate, uh, uh, affiliate sites that are out in more rural areas or less academic or a different vibe, you're still at uh, a risk for... Um, a less working in a less progressive culture. They can't protect you from patients. If you work at the VA, you're going to hear and see some crazy stuff. 
So um, something that you can think about for those residents that are starting residency this summer or, or in residency now, like, you know, be aware that these situations can present even when you're at the most uh, cultured of programs, if you will. If you are a medical student or a resident physician, I want to talk about an incredible resource, one that I personally used to get through the intraining exams as well as my anesthesiology board exams. I'm talking about TrueLearn. TrueLearn is an incredible resource. It's a test question bank that provides a data-driven approach to prepare for standardized exams. The products they offer include question banks for the medical licensure exam, whether that's the Comlex or the USMLE for medical students, and then several subspecialty licensure exams in the fields of anesthesiology, obstetrics and gynecology, general surgery, pediatrics, emergency medicine, internal medicine, psychiatry, family medicine, or neurology. I know every year when I had to study for the anesthesiology and training exams, I used TrueLearn. I also used this question bank and resource to study for my board exams, which I've thankfully passed since. They are providing a discount. So everybody loves discounts. If you sign up for a question bank, use the code BDPODCAST. That's BD Podcast, right? Black Doctors Podcast. And when you use that discount code, you will save $25 off of your subscription to any of the True Learn products. This incredible offer is available now through the end of the year, so don't miss out. Yeah, man. Um, I, I think for me, <laughs> I had a little bit of bark in the beginning. I think I had a little bit of bark all the way through because I, I mean, I wouldn't let anybody. T- <laughs> I wouldn't let anybody. I mean, I am a surgeon, and you know, we're notorious for having attitudes. Hey, what six foot four? Yeah, four. <laughs> yeah. <Okay>. two forty. <laughs> I went 240 back then. I was more like 215, 210. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I I think you just have to, you know, not try to overexpose yourself or not get caught up into it. You know, right. I mean, you have to do the Michelle Obama thing. You know, when they go low, you go high. There was a couple yeah. of times I went low, but if you're going to go low, you better have a lot of clout. <laughs> you, better, you better be strong how'd you, how'd, on how'd, your how'd recommendations. You, how'd you go low, man? Is that still uh, under wraps? Man, I remember uh, one time I was coming in to see a patient, the market patient for, um, I think I was at the VA, and I opened the curtain. I was like, hey, I'm Dr. Triggs. I'm uh, here to uh, get your consent. He was like, who are you? Who, what did he say? He was like, uh, who are you? Are you the doctor? Well, I was like, I ain't the maid. You ready? <laughs> Man, he was, he was living. He turned bright red. I, like, I ain't the maid, brother. <laughs> I just told you who I was. So right. that was, I mean, I, had a real, I got a real smart mouth. So I was, <laughs> I just was letting it ride. <laughs> man, yeah, we could talk all day about, man, working through the things you experienced in residency, but you got through by the grace of God. You, you've been right. praying mother. You made it through. Yep. Um, you took your first job. You went from Tampa, which is a, a pretty lit city, yeah. mm-hmm. to, I got to say this, I got to read it, um, Gallipolis, Ohio. Yeah. Yeah, Gallipolis, Ohio. Yep. What what brought you there to that job, and what was your experience like going to like a very rural part of the country? Right. So I found out about a job through one of those random recruiter emails. Um, I remember I was uh, interviewing at different places. I knew I didn't want to do a fellowship. I wanted to get right into it. And so um, I read the benefits package. I read where it's at. So I called the recruiter and was like, hey, um, I got your email. I just wanted to hear a little bit about the the position. So I grew up in a rural town in Alabama and um, I was like, well, I wouldn't mind like checking it out for, it was a two year contract. You know, I could do two years, get to my boards, you know, kind of learn how to operate on my own and um, just kind of see how it goes. And so like I went up there, my first look and interviewed, I liked what they were trying to do. It was a a small uh, rural healthcare system. So they had multiple sites all over, but I would be at the main branch. Um, they, they had like a good patient base, like a lot of, uh, they had some cosmetics, they had some like skin cancer, a lot of breast reconstruction, all the bread and butter, plastic surgery stuff that I wanted to do and was, okay. was fine with doing. And I got to like run my own practice. So if there was stuff I didn't want to do, you know, I could refer it out and stuff like that. So that was kind of like the big driver for me, but it was in the middle of nowhere. But the people were great. I still, I, I miss those people. I still keep in contact with my, my nurse today and, Man. uh, secretary. Yeah. So how like how big of a hospital, how many operating rooms did they have at this hospital? 
Oh, man, they had an ambulatory surgery center, I think, with like four rooms. And then they had like the main ORs, which was like it's like seven, seven ORs. They did a lot of ortho, a lot of general, of course. The general surgeons were doing all types of coles and stuff like that, you know, kind of like bread and butter general surgery stuff. And then, you know, they had had a plastic surgeon at like five years earlier, but he had retired. And so, you know, I did like a lot of breast reconstruction, a lot of skin cancer reconstruction and then some cosmetics yeah. out there. And you mentioned something that I know I didn't realize until halfway through residency for some surgical specialties. I know, you know, we can't be board certified for usually like a year out. You've got mm-hmm. like anesthesia. We take oral boards and written boards, but some specialties you actually have to do a case collection period. So yours was what, two years? Yep. Two years. And then like you have to collect at, at minimum 50 major reconstructive cases within uh, nine months. Then they have to look at those cases to see if they're worthy to be able to sit. Then they choose seven to 10 cases to, to, uh, to test you on. And so you have to put together these huge, like patient, what they call them, uh, case books where you have like before and after pictures, uh, long term pictures. And they always pick your complications, like your worst complications, how you did to manage the patient. They look at your billing to make sure you're ethical, make sure you're not unbundling. You know, charging people oh, wow. different things. Yeah, uh, they they look at that. They look at your terminology. They look at your op- of course. They look at your anesthesia reports to see if you were operate like you, why was this patient's uh, systolic this low? You know, why didn't you stop the operation? What were you doing during that uh, situation? They look at they nitpick like crazy. They make sure that you're operating the standard of care. You're not doing something that's that just got released in a journal. You know, okay. So it's yeah, it's wild. <laughs> That's wild, but that's that's behind you. We moved on to bigger and better things. You, uh, it's, but it's important to note that you know. So it seems like there's not a lot of transition in that first year or two because you need to get your cases correct. Mm-hmm. Right. You kind of yeah. stuck. Um, but after that, you moved to beautiful, sunny Miami. That's right. You started a job in private practice. How was that transition like for you? Oh man, so Miami is a whole different ball game when it comes to plastic surgery. Um, I think if I had I went to like Atlanta or you know maybe like you no know, another like like Dallas or something like that, the transition probably would have been a little bit smoother. In Miami, it's uh, it's its own. It has its own culture to the point where mm-hmm. patients um, develop like. Instagram and Facebook profiles based off of their wish picks, what their body, how they buy, how they want their body to look. They'll put their BMI on there, their surgeon that did like, you know, whatever surgery on them, what surgery they're going to get next. No other place in the country really does that outside of like the DR and uh, in Columbia, I believe. And so it's like, it's got its own subculture. So if you botch a patient, you're on all over the surgery blogs. Oh. You're on, uh, yeah, on these Facebook groups. Like, you know, they call themselves dolls. So like, you know, they have like a doc, like there's Dr. Triggs dolls or Dr. Triggs vixens. And these are patients that are either getting surgery by me or have had surgery by me because it's almost like a fan base. You didn't name them that. No, no. That's what they call themselves. Or there'll be like a, (laughs) you know, uh, like, so my partner at Vixen is Dr. Cannon, Dr. Cannon doll or Dr. uh, Cannon vixens. So, you know, uh, it's almost like a fan base and they ride for you because they, because a lot of times it's like, they'll tell you, like, you changed my life, you know? Wow. And, uh, but it's, it's crazy. Look, like you have to be on top of it and you have, and you have to like be real with them and their expectations and manage their expectations and let them know like what you can and can't do. Uh, because if you don't deliver, everybody's going to know, <laughs> they're going to know. And they, and you might get, it's like, there's like pages, like the shade room, there's the surgery room. You know, and if you're not on top of your stuff, you get posted on there, you get dragged. It's 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 what? a real deal. It's crazy. Yeah. That's wild. Man, I thought you a little misogynistic with this truth this tricks doll stuff. But no, okay. no, this is what the patients do. This is wow. what the patients do. Yeah. They hold you to a high a whole different standard. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it makes things a little bit more stressful, but you know, a lot of patients, you just I mean. Since I've been, you know, training in plastic surgery, you know, the, the first part they tell you is all about managing expectations. You have to know exactly what they want, if you can deliver that. And, you know, I have like very honest uh, conversations with my patients. And I think that's why I'm pretty sought after. That's what a lot of my patients tell me. They're like, yeah, I heard you tell p- patients the truth. You're not just trying to get their money. And it's true because I don't want to deal with that headache afterwards. I'm not going to 
you know, promise you something and not be able to deliver just to like, you know, get your money. That's that's not what I signed up to do this for. So. Yeah. So, man, definitely um, learned a lot in a very short amount of time. It, it seems like what's a typical day or week like for you at your current practice? So um, it's it's busy. So I I usually operate starting around nine, ten o'clock because I'm um, because I'm low man on the totem pole. The, the big chief starts early. So, you know, just like like any other hospital system, like, you know, I get like the, the unwanted block time. Mm-hmm. But uh, for the most part, they accommodate for me. But, you know, uh, I, uh, I mark my patients. I check their chart, labs, stuff like that, the important stuff. Go in there, you know, ask them if they have any questions. I go through my whole list bill. They get a, which is already on the handout, but they need to hear it from me. Like, again, I have to make sure their expectations are reasonable. Uh, I'm you them seen up. them? You seen them before today, or are you meeting them for the first time? Uh, I see them before the day. Okay. So uh, there are some patients though that I see almost the day of. Like I've either seen their pictures uh, virtually or something like that because I have coordinators that'll come and be like, "This patient, they'll review the chart and stuff like that." So I've either reviewed, I've always reviewed their chart before I've seen them right. and reviewed their photos. But some patients I don't meet until the day of. There's some patients, okay. though, that'll be local because I get a lot. Most of my patients, I would say 85 percent travel. So wow. that's the reason why. So I don't meet them to the day. of. Uh, but the patients I do get to meet before, you know, I mark them, you know, mark them up and we get the, you know, it speeds up the process. So but I'm like operating, uh, <laughs> bouncing between surgeries. Then I'll, sometimes I'll have patients that will come for a consult. So as the room's getting turned over, I'll go run see them, talk to them, um, you know, you know, basically they, they get their new patient evaluation. Then I'm back in the operating room, but I'm usually done uh, by seven o'clock, something like that. Okay. And you're at a surgery center or at a hospital base? Yeah. Or? Surgery center. Yeah. How many operating rooms? Man, uh, four. Four. Y- y'all hiring, man? <laughs> hey, you know, I mean, the, the demand is here. It's, uh, it's what we call high season right now. People have a lot of disposable Ooh. incomes and, you know, everybody's trying to get that summer body before summer gets here. So yeah, hi- hire me, man. I'll come down there and do a little, hey. a little razzle. Hey, we'll take you. hey, man, I need some blocks and stuff because it'll definitely make things easier for me. Yeah, for sure. Dope. So um, with that transition from Ohio to Miami, looking back, is there anything that you would have done differently? You know, I, I think I answered, uh, asked myself this question. I, I don't think so. I think where, where like my steps were ordered pretty well because I think I got, of course, you know, as a young surgeon, I knew how to operate, but I think I got uh, better in Ohio being on my own, like having to figure things out. I was under a lot more pressure because I was the only plastic surgeon for the whole mm-hmm. um, healthcare system. Um, so that forced me to really like, you know, look into the articles, like be really diligent, set up good habits, like, you know, in, in, in terms of reviewing for cases and stuff like that. And then it just like having that knowledge of working in a hospital, uh, hospital based system. And then, you know, coming to Miami and it being, you know, almost like the wild, wild west and uh, figuring things out. I don't think I would change the experience at all. I've met great people in Ohio that I still keep in contact with. I still have a great relationship with the healthcare system out there. I mean, there's times where I think I may even start doing some reconstructive cases back for that hospital just because, okay. you know, I miss that that part of it because I do all cosmetics now. Um, but no, I, I think how things have have played out is exactly how they're supposed to. And I don't have any any regrets in that. Awesome. As we start to wrap up, I'll let you pick some topics. You want to talk about cosmetic surgery versus plastic surgery, or you want to talk about medical tourism? So I'll talk about medical tourism. So there are some really good surgeons like in the Caribbean, because that's usually where most people go to the Caribbean, like DR, um, uh, you know, the Dominican Republic, Colombia, some places in Mexico, Brazil. A lot of these surgeons, you know, teach uh, surgeons in America, like they have courses or they come to like uh, conferences, like one of the conferences, uh, Baker Gordon, where they'll bring in like like big name surgeons, but they charge just as much as we charge in the States if you're good. So flying out there thinking, you know, you're getting discounted surgery is not necessarily the truth. Uh, the, the healthcare laws are a lot more lax, so they can be a little bit more aggressive, but even like the top name guys aren't going to be super aggressive like that because they don't want any major complications. And mm-hmm. so a lot of times patients go out there, they're like, oh, this is like, you know, thousands of dollars cheaper. 
However, this person may have a, uh, or this doctor may have like a reputation, you know what I'm saying, for not, you know, you know, having some real bad complications. So you have to be really careful. I feel like if you can't like really speak the language, and you have no support system down there, you probably don't need to be mm-hmm. going down there. At least in um, a lot of people like it, though, because overseas, they'll allow you to stay in a hospital overnight versus here in the States. I don't care what city it is. You're not going to stay in a hospital after a cosmetic procedure unless it's done in the hospital and the cost is going to be outrageous. But, you know, if you can't really communicate what's going on, you don't have like a family support system, you probably should stay either local or, you know, say stay within the United States in itself. And, you know, you can't take any legal action if something happens. So, you know, I, 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 I prefer that, you know, patients stay in the U.S. because one, if things don't go right, you can hold them accountable. Two, you can speak the language. Three, uh, you can really get the reviews and also uh, check their credentials uh, in the state. You can't really do that unless it's someone really well known and they're going to charge you just as much as they do in the states. Um, when it comes to because there was a, some drama in a Facebook group about mm-hmm. plastic surgeons sending folks to family practice docs in the ER to get their drains pulled. Right. Is that that? Cap or not, they just need to suck it up and pull the drains. Or I, hey, I I feel like if they if they feel comfortable, like I'm not gonna send my patient to to get their drain pulled by someone that's uncomfortable doing it. Um, I do tell them though when they like before I even made them, I was like, you have someone because a lot of times your drains may not be ready to be pulled before you leave. Because I recommend all my patients to stay at least five to seven days, especially and my tummy. So they're gonna fly to Miami and stay in Miami for a week. Essentially. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Especially for BBLs and tummy tucks, like the bigger procedures uh, when I use drains. And so if they're doing that, I can try to get the drain out. But if it's not ready, you know, I tell them beforehand, I'm like, do you have anyone that would be comfortable taking your drains out? Because they got to get medical clearance no matter what procedure. Mm-hmm. So they have to talk to their primary care doctor and let them know. And a lot of times their primary care doctor will let them know, like, yeah, I'm OK with taking out the drain or something like okay. that. But they they need to have a clue because I, I tell them, like, you know, it may not be ready. Especially if they're having like full back lipo and they're going to be dumping out a lot of like interstitial fluid, you know, as they as they heal, you know, a drink's not going to be ready to come out in five to seven days. So I leave it up to them. They know beforehand. So, but I don't mind it because I, I make it foolproof. And then I've actually talked to doctors over the phone on how to okay. do. It. Okay. I, cool. I, yeah, for sure. Like they'll be like, "Oh, it's okay. I can cut this stitch." And sometimes I'll even draw a diagram or I'll Facetime them. So, yeah, I, I'm super accessible with that. All right. We we'll hope that's a pace offering to the folks in uh, emergency departments and primary I, care across the so. across the nation. Hope we don't see uh, Doctor Triggs patients in extremis. La- if, last if, if you do, if you do, you can always reach out to me. I, I take constructive criticism all day long. There we go. Last question: uh, TikTok or Instagram? I'm a big uh, Instagram person. I have TikTok. I have a TikTok. I barely use it. I've been trying to use it more. I actually have my social media person posting my TikToks now. Uh, oh. But I already have an addiction to Instagram. I don't need another addiction to TikTok. So that's why I've been trying to stay away from it. And I, I don't like like dancing on uh, on social media. I don't want anybody critiquing sorry, my say, moves. Say, say that again, because I feel I like even... I... Don't make, don't make me pull up. <laughs> I don't like dancing on TikTok. I don't need anybody trying to like critique my moves. So yeah, that's that's why I stay with the the IG with the Instagram. Well, <laughs> if someone did perhaps want to see you dance on TikTok and or Instagram or find out more about uh, Dr. Wilton Triggs, become a Triggs doll. Yeah, where can they find you? So they can find me at Dr. Triggs Miami uh, or at W Triggs MD. Uh, both are linked together, so you can always see in the bio to click on another one. Or if you're interested in booking a free consultation at Vixen Plastic Surgery, you know, it's it's just a click and we can go from there. So they can see all my antics and see everything plastic surgery related. I also have a, I'm revamping my YouTube channel. I just wrote the okay. script for a whole season. The first season's on all Brazilian butt lifts, every little detail, history, the types, uh, instruments we use. Uh, risk. I have a whole episode on anemia because that's a big one. Hmm. So be looking out for that. It's going to be professionally awesome. done. We're going to have all types of graphics and stuff like that. Putting a lot yeah, of money. <laughs> what's the what's the um, YouTube page? It'll be. It should be WTRXMD. I think like backslash YouTube or something like that. Awesome. Well, y'all keep yeah. an eye out 
for all of that. Check out his videos. You can see uh, some of Dr. Triggs' work. You may not be safe for work, uh, depending on what you're right. looking at, but uh, <laughs> check it out. Dr. Triggs, thank you so much for joining us on the Black Doctors Podcast. Again, you're welcome anytime because representation does matter. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. The Black Doctors Podcast is a nonprofit volunteer passion project with the goal of inspiring all who listen. If you enjoy listening, tell a friend about the show or share a link on social media. We are a small team and can use all the help we can get. You can reach us at the Black Doctors Podcast on Instagram or at Stephen Bradley MD on Twitter or Instagram. Tune in next week for another episode of the Black Doctors Podcast because representation matters.